I sat over here uh, for every word, and I trust that you sensed the same thing that I was sensing. This was none other than the word of the Lord being spoken to us. I felt, and I, 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 if you go to this church, I avoid saying words like I felt. I don't believe in emotional theology. Although our God is a God of emotions, we're never to base our theology on emotion. But I felt like I had gotten kicked in the stomach, but with hope. I felt like I had the air knocked out of me, but as Abraham learned, shall not the God of all the earth do right, saith the Lord. And in that moment, I just, I just felt that we should have, and I know if he would have felt free in his own house, his own church, David would have had us go to prayer. I think we need to pray it right now before I say one other word, and, and, and believe me, I'm not cutting into my own time because honestly, my notes tonight, there's so much, if not 90% of what I have has already been said, and I'm not kidding. If I get into my message tonight, you'll see that that is in fact true. But I was so moved by his message because it's exactly what I and this church believe. And it's a hard thing to watch your country die right in front of your face. If it was just Lisa and I, it's sad, but I could let it go. But then when I think about my daughters, it gets me a little concerned, you know? And then when I look into the faces of my grandkids and the third one about ready to, to be born, it just makes me sick. But thank God, because listen, just like the Lord speaks, where it takes the wind out of you, but there's the infusion of reality and truth. When Dr. Reagan said, the time for national salvation has passed. That's, he didn't use that term, but that's what he was saying. National salvation. That's done. It's, 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 it's passed. We have thumbed our nose at God as a nation. Remember that. But personal salvation and personal revival is always, always available. Always available. And so let's pray. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind, would you, if, if you'd like to, if you're able to go to your knees, let's do that. Father, we come to you tonight moved by the word of your Holy Spirit speaking through our brother David. Father, I thank you that tonight in, in, his, in his message, in his obedience to speak what you gave him, Lord, I had a chance to personally hear from you, and it's always a terrifying wonder. As you, Lord, just confirmed, this is my spirit bearing witness with your spirit. Father, for many of us for a long time, we have sensed the approaching of the end of the book, as it were. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that what looks like beyond hope we still ask. We're still able to breathe. You are always on your throne. So we pray somehow, in some way, Lord, you'd spare our nation. As ripe and as true as it is, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would give us one more generation like you did with Nineveh. One, you, one more time. You gave them 40 years after Jonah pronounced judgment. And what looks like an impossibility, Father, I pray that you'd send revival to your church to your people, and Father, that if it might be even so abundantly supplied that it might, Lord, stay the hand of judgment that is justifiably rightly to be levied against this nation as a country. We cast ourselves down, Lord, at your feet of mercy. We pray, Father God, that this message that was given would go out to the ends of this nation, coast to coast, border to border. Father God, please receive us. Give us hearts of repentance as a church 
as a people. Lord, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. And Listen, um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, you can turn in your Bible so you can just pay attention. We're going to hopefully cover some ground tonight uh, in scripture references, but uh, a little less than normal uh, because I've got, I, I trust, a, a lot of quotes that might encourage you. I've got to say that I, I'm looking at a message that I, I, I realized a moment ago I've got a couple of titles. Uh, Dr. Hawking gave me America's Constitution and Laws from a Biblical Perspective. America's Constitution and Laws is, is supposed to be the title of what I'm doing, and yet I caught myself uh, putting a, a different title on there, God Shed His Grace on Thee, America. God Shed His Grace on Thee, America, is my prayer. But we'll begin tonight looking at Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 10, the latter part of the verse. It says, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Awesome verse from Leviticus, an announcement made to God's people. And I'm wondering if some of you recognize where that might be, where that is found here in the United States. A nation that is unlike any other nation in the history of mankind, our beginnings can only be related or looked at as it was with Israel. God obviously created Israel. You can read about it in your Bible. When you look at the creation of all of the other nations on earth, there are some wonderful stories, but none of them, friends, listen, none of them can compare to what God did in the creation of the United States. And I want to warn you tonight, I would not read any educational system of uh, publication regarding American history that is, that is newer than 1927. If you want to find out about American history, you've got to go back. Don't read anything newer than 1927. It's all filled with revisionism. That's why if you go online and you look at some of the quotes of the Founding Fathers, one of the first things that you'll see on some of these web searches are things, uh, comments made. Did Thomas Jefferson really say that? Oh, this, this, uh, this fact check uh, minute, uh, you know, work uh, found out that John Adams didn't do that, or neither did John Hank. It's a bunch of lies. You ought to go back to their actual writings and read it from their own diaries. But when I give you Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof, if you've ever been to Philadelphia, you've seen the Liberty Bell. Have you not? And at the Liberty Bell, which here it is in case there in Philadelphia, if you look to find out where and why that verse is important to us in the context of this message, it says this, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, it announces that we are to proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. Our founders thought it was important enough to use Bible to define what was happening in this nation. In the early years of the use of bells in America, in this case certainly the Liberty Bell, I found it interesting to discover that there was a trinity of reasons why it was rung. Number one, it was rung to summon lawmakers to legislative sessions. Number two, it was an alert to the citizens of the city or town regarding danger. Number three, it was to gather the people for public proclamations. As was the day, by the way, of July 4th, 1776, the Liberty Bell was rung and Pennsylvania to announce the birth of our nation. And I don't know if you realize this or not or have enjoyed it, but every year the United States celebrates what becomes another Guinness World Book of Records, and that is on the 4th of July, most recent, for 240 years, the United States has been under a constitutional form of government, this republic, without change. The same document for 240 years has governed this nation and many call it a miracle. Number one, the timing of it all. Before the great French Revolution, the, the mayhem of what took place in Europe following this nation's birth, the things leading up to it, the, 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 the founding of this nation between great global uh, commerce and upheaval. God had strategically placed the birth of this nation on a continent that he had radically preserved. All for a reason. 
Some would say that it was to get rich. Some would say that the founders came here because they wanted to expand their ability to make money. Not at all. But that's what you get out of modern-day revisionism. The truth of the matter is, this nation was founded, as you've heard today, I feel like a broken record, but to proclaim the gospel. I find it interesting that as I'm to talk a little bit about the Constitution in this message, that the first section of the three articles of the Constitution speak about the separation of powers. We've all heard that. We hear about that a lot in the election season. But are you aware that the separation of powers, uh, our founding fathers got out of a document uh, by the philosopher, the political, really, activist of his day and thinker, John Locke. If you've read any American history, the very genesis of so much of what became America and our laws and the way that we conduct ourselves as a government came from John Locke. And it's interesting because when you look at John Locke, John Locke being considered a founding father of the Enlightenment, he's also been accredited with the separation of powers doctrine. You say, who cares? Well, you'll care in a moment, Christian, because John Locke wrote that it was God who was the architect of the separation of powers when he said, I quote, in Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge, our judiciary. The Lord is our lawgiver, the legislative, and the Lord is our king, the executive. That's how this nation came about, based upon the Bible. People will rival that in schools. Uh, professors will put that thinking down. And I'm here to tell you right now that John Locke was the man who, who set it in motion. Our founding fathers adopted that, and notice its genesis was from the very book of the prophet Isaiah 33, 22. Yet Barack Obama proclaims that we are not, nor have, have been, founded as a Christian nation. He's wrong. Of course, if he would have studied American history, he would have known that, but it only proves that he didn't. God shed his grace on us, please God, upon America, though he does not owe it to us. I believe that God called America to remember our ordained beginnings, and I believe that God is calling America now to remember that. To what end, I don't know. Is there hope for America? I have to agree with Dr. Reagan, and I've felt that for a long time. I don't see national hope. We've got the greatest military in the face of the earth and the weakest will to use it. We've got all the comfort and wealth of the things that you and I possess, yet we possess nothing. The United States citizen, on the average, we are thought to be the wealthiest people on earth, and yet our nation per citizen is the most debt-ridden person on the planet. You see, that's ridiculous. The guy in Africa, all he has is a spear in a hut. He owns that spear in a hut. Each of us as individuals, because of our national debt, are in it hundreds of thousands of dollars that we'll never be able to pay. We can get so fixated on that, we can forget God had a plan for this nation. To what end in our day? I don't know. But where would you like me to begin my argument? I have written down in my notes to ask you, where would you like me to begin? Because some people would say, well, let's begin with the pilgrims, and that's cool, we'll talk a lot about them tonight. We could certainly begin with Christopher Columbus, I highly recommend uh, the Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall. It was mentioned tonight by Dr. Reagan. You want to know what Christopher Columbus was really about versus the History Channel? Read Christopher Columbus in his own words. What was his vision? What did God speak to him about? But did you realize that there was a man converted from paganism to Christianity by the name of Leif Erikson, the, the, the Viking? Did you know that he was, he's considered to be the first man to visit this North American continent? Did you know that? By the way, he looked around, he, and, and he didn't see any value in it, and he went back to Europe. That God had kept this continent, this nation, protected between two vast seas for a great purpose. What was that purpose? God is asking us to remember. I don't know what's to become of our nation, but I know this, God's word never changes, it's always true, and God calls us to remember those former things. To remember that God was at work. America can say that. We've got a history to look back upon. And even if our nation is doomed by her own doing, we can still look back at the God that is faithful. And he'll be faithful to you and your family. He'll be faithful to your cry as an individual. Listen, our nation may not repent. Listen, Daniel loved Israel, but Israel went into bondage, into Babylon. 
Daniel suffered. We will suffer. We will suffer. We will see that. So we'll, we will suffer under national judgment. Just know this when it comes as a Christian. God will not be judging you personally. Jesus took that judgment on the cross for our sins. But we're part of this nation. Don't think for a moment. Now look, all of us, I, would try, I know all of us on this speaking panel, believe that Jesus Christ should have come back about an hour ago. I've changed my view. I used to say, I hope he comes back in an hour. I, no, I'm past that now. I, he should have come back an hour ago. I'm ready for him now. Are you ready for him now? Listen, I am so ready for him now. And for his grace to appear. But if he doesn't appear, we may be called upon to suffer, as we heard tonight, for being a Christian. Those days are coming. Don't worry. The church will become so pure under such persecution. The church will be that amazing and awesome and beautiful, glorious power. But we need to remember that you and I are situated in a nation that God had preserved and kept safe on a continent between two great seas. William Bradford, in the book written by Nathaniel Philbrick entitled the Mayflower, wrote, we know that we are pilgrims, wrote Bradford. They knew that. They knew that. And they came. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And William Bradford numerous times referred to that portion of Hebrews 11.13. God had a founding for this nation for a purpose. Benjamin Franklin said, and I quote, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks, closed attendance, continual reasonings with each other, our different sentiments on almost every question, several of the last producing as many no's as yea's, is methinks a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. He's speaking, by the way, to members of Congress. We indeed seem to feel our own wants of political wisdom, since we have been running about in search of it. We have gone back to the ancient history for molds of government and examined the different forms of those republics which have been formed with the seeds of their own dissolution now no longer exist. And we have viewed modern states all around Europe, but we find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how is it, as it happens, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understandings? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, no offense, Dr. Paul, when we were sensible of our danger, we had daily prayer in this room for the divine protection, our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? To that kind of providence... We owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace of the means of establishing our future natural felicity. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? He said that at the age of 81. Statesman, inventor, diplomat Benjamin Franklin on July 28th, 1787. Was Franklin right? Did the founders seek God, and when our founding fathers that you and I are aware of spoke of their founding fathers, who were they talking about? On November 11, 1620, quote, needing to maintain order and to establish a civil society, William Bradford aboard the Mayflower wrote, and you heard it earlier this morning. This is interesting, by the way. Where do you go to a, a message or a gathering where people, have, people are going to quote the Mayflower Compact twice in one day? In the name of God, amen, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, 
by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Ladies and gentlemen, this document can be viewed. I remember seeing it on tour at the Reagan Library. We're being told this nation had no Christian upbringing at all, that there's no umbilical cord in the birth of this nation to Almighty God. It's too bad William Bradford didn't know that. In the Pilgrims, and honor of our king and country a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine our, ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have uh, hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, Ireland, the 18th in Scotland, and he goes on in 1620. God, Christianity, spreading the gospel. The first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, John Northrop, Winthrop, excuse me, said, we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. Like a prophet, he said that. John Winthrop. Ronald Reagan read that and made that famous in our age, that America needs to be again like a city set on a hill. He got that from Winthrop. But did you know that when you look at Winthrop and read him, where did he get it from? The Bible says he got it from Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Jesus said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And that founding father of the founding fathers said, whatever God's going to do in this colony of America, or technically at that time, this colony of Virginia, it's going to be like a city set on a hill. God was speaking to him. In the great words of Patrick Henry, Christian, patriot, founding father, he says, quote, I cannot, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Announce that in a public school and see how it goes. We have forsaken our ancient boundaries and borders that God has given us. We have forgotten God's promises to us. Our founders were not confused by that. Noah Webster. Noah Webster says, the religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of Christ and his apostles, which enjoins humility, piety, benevolence, which acknowledges in every person a brother or a sister or a citizen with equal rights. This is Genuine Christianity, and to this we owe our free constitutions of government, said Noah Webster, one of our founding fathers. The next thing I want you to think about tonight is that God called America to come out from all the nations of the world. Now that's a, a phraseology that we reserve for Israel and the Jewish people, and by all means we, we must. I just find it extremely interesting and comforting that America was a, a work of God, knowing what he was going to do with America, that in the United States of America that would be, would be a gathering of people from, as it were, all types under heaven. Isn't it amazing? You think about that for a moment. God made America such a place that people from Italy, Peru, Russia, France, wherever in the world, they wanted to come here. And you could never still to this day, technically, you could never go around today or back then and draw blood from somebody's veins and uh, find out uh, that they were an American. You could do that if you're German. You could do that if you're Portuguese. You could trace that. To be an American is to come to an understanding. It's to embrace something that the world had never seen before that you would come to these shores and that you would assimilate into this nation with the American understanding. The American understanding is that all men are created equal. It wasn't some DNA. Americans don't have a DNA. To be an American is a choice. It's something that you decide that you want to believe. 
And it's an amazing thing. It's unlike any other thing that's ever happened on earth. But today we have people not even caring about becoming Americans. They want to come here and change the way things are. They don't want to assimilate. And listen, the truth of the matter is our culture no longer has got anything to give anybody. What America once was, America has lost. Dr. Reagan was talking about Sundays. Are you old enough to remember Sundays? I remember my dad had a gas station, and that gas station was closed on Sundays. We had to get gas on Saturday because Sunday was coming. You had to get ready for Sunday. Nothing was open. There was a reverence. Not anymore. It's an amazing thing to realize what God had called us to as a nation. The world had never seen anything like it. The great experiment. God moved upon this country. He had done things here. He had created things here. Inventions, prosperity, peace. The United States, just by its influence, used to, used to export the spirit of peace, the spirit of hope. Granted, America, listen, it's, it's flawed. Every nation's flawed. There's humans in them. But the amazing thing was other nations got hope from what America had achieved. Other nations wanted to copy what had happened here. God was doing something. Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What an amazing statement. If you've been to New York, you've seen the Statue of Liberty where it says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Listen to this, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest-tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. America was the hope of the world. And by the way, that hope and that vision came from a Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. This culture is changing. I think it's absolutely prophetically, tragically biblical that America has not only turned its back on the God of the Bible, America is headlong embracing Islam, a foreign pagan God, a system completely, absolutely opposite of the Bible and of God and God's liberty and God's freedom. And this nation is hated by those who embrace tyranny and death. What is going on? What's happening? We have forgotten what God has put together. And we've, listen, I am not going to lay the blame at the feet of the State House in Sacramento or in the Capitol. I agree with all the other speakers today. The problem has to be laid at the foot of not just the church, most specifically the pulpits, most specifically at the feet of America's pastors for so many years. They're silent. They're timid. They're scared. They, they thought by speaking out they might lose their tax-exempt status, which means they fear losing mammon more than the pleasure of God. Pulpits are compromised because pastors are compromised. Churches are compromised. And for that, the nation's compromised. God wanted the pulpits to speak and show the way. And we haven't done it. God called this nation. In fact, I'm going to read you in a little bit about how the pulpits influenced America. And you ask yourself that that's happening in the world today. Our founders had no problems, by the way, if you've read them, from drafting or lifting from the facts and similitudes and typologies from Scripture. Samuel Adams was famous for this. History tells us that Thomas Jefferson said there never would have been a revolution without Samuel Adams. And tragically, most young people today have never heard of Sam Adams, except at the liquor store or at the beer tap at the bar. Samuel Adams is accredited with being the very spirit of the revolution. Harvard graduate, went to Harvard to be raised up as a pastor. His dad told him, you're horrible, you can't speak publicly, you can never do that. And John Adams said of his cousin, poor Samuel, he was born a rebel. 
And yet Thomas Jefferson said no one understood the spirit of freedom more than Samuel Adams. And when Samuel Adams wrote in his writings, he understood freedom from those that he had been related to from the Cotton Mather. You ever heard of Cotton Mather? His family. Samuel Adams married into that family. He'd go to church and he would hear, he said, liberty preached from the pulpit. Samuel Adams might have been a brat, but he was listening. And he stirred up a revolution that led to the greatest liberty and experiment the world has ever seen. And you're sitting in it, or what's left of it. Daniel Webster said, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard and to defend it. And that's where we as a nation and we as pastors in America failed the American vision and dream, is that we did not defend it. Again, Thomas Jefferson wrote, timid men prefer the calm despotism to the tempestuous sea of liberty. Liberty is hard to maintain. We have a nation now that mocks soldiers and Navy that are signing up to go defend our nation. We all love our freedoms, but the truth of the matter is the only way that we can enjoy our freedoms is if there's young people out there defending them all around the world. That's how we came here tonight is because there's people around the world protecting us. Our nation used to believe that if you had an enemy somewhere in the world by virtue of intelligence, you stop that enemy on their soil before they ever get here. We don't believe that anymore. Where where are you to fight your enemy? If you find out you have an enemy, you don't fight him in your backyard. You fight him in their backyard. Our nation has lost that. Our freedom is a perception now. It's not a reality. And I have this gut feeling, this sense that America's last twilight's gleaming. You can sense it in your gut. Earlier today, I don't know who it was. I don't remember who it was. Pastor Barry, I think. We're talking. It doesn't matter who it was. We're, we agreed upon this, whoever it was. Nothing seems to satisfy us as Christians of this world anymore. It used to be even a nice sunset. And now it's just, thank you, God, but I'd like to come home now. Something has happened. It's bigger than our nation. The time in which we live is a kairos moment. God is about to do something, and we need to be so ready. And I trust that you in this room are ready. You're here tonight. You've been here today. But just remember where you've come from, what God has done in this country. It's not a political statement I'm making. God created this nation. He created it for a reason. And tragically, those great reasons we don't seem to care about anymore. Imagine this coming from a Supreme Court justice of today, chief justice, mind you, because the words I read right now are from Chief Justice John Jay. The Americans are the first people whom heaven has favored with an opportunity of deliberating upon and choosing the forms of government under which they should live. He went on to say, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians to to be their rulers. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, ladies and gentlemen, said that. Can you imagine that being said today? Jefferson's words seem to be almost prophetic when he said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. Proverbs 29, verse 2, we heard again today. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Listen to this. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't get involved in politics. That's how we got in this mess. Good people fight for good things. God's people fight for God's things. God, listen, Daniel tells us that God's the one that establishes the borders of nations. That's politics. We've given up, listen, we've given up government, which God ordained, to the whims of politicians. Not good. God gave us such an amazing opportunity as a nation to hold our leaders accountable that we placed into power, and when they stepped out of line, we threw them out. Now we don't even notice what they're doing. 
We're too busy. We're too distracted. We're playing Pokemon. <laughs> We're falling into ditches. I had a police officer tell me that he was at the mall the other day on patrol, walking, and he said two kids playing Pokemon physically ran right into him and then looked at him as though he had somehow ruined their lives. <laughs> they never looked up. One guy fell off a cliff in La Jolla, 90 feet down to the beach, playing Pokemon. I wish I had that kind of focus on the Bible. I'd like to be read, read my Bible and fall off the end of this. Well, I don't want to be a prophet or anything, but you know what I mean? It's like, oh, this is so fantastic. No, we're so distracted. We have forgotten what God has given us as a nation. We're distracted. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. America's been groaning for a long time, and I don't mean for the, on Obama's administration... We, we've been moaning on Obama's administration. I got to tell you, I've been, I, I moan through Bush's administration. Look, I'm, from, I'm born and raised in California. I, I've been moaning ever since Ronald Reagan left the presidency. And at least he was honest enough to tell us he wasn't perfect. But I, I tell you what, the guy cared about the nation. We're groaning. Charles Finney, ever hear him? A Christian involved with a statement that he is attributed here to making lectures on revivals of religion. Charles Finney, quote, 1868, the time has come that Christians must vote for honest men. It'd be great if we can find one, but, and take consistent ground in politics or the Lord will curse them. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this matter, but the time has come when they must act differently. Christians seem to act as if they thought God did not see what they do in politics. But I tell you, he does see it, and he will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. He was a prophet. Oh, we don't get involved in that stuff. No, you know, we just preach the word, pastor. That's all we seem to hear these days from liberal, ineffective impotent churches. We just preach the gospel. We don't get involved in cultural events and situations. We don't defend abortion. I had a pastor tell me abortion, those issues, marriage between a man and a woman, those are political issues. That's surrendering where I come from. That's letting the system define what God has already decreed as eternal. Matthew chapter 5, I said part of it a moment ago. Matthew 5, 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Think about what he was saying. He's speaking to his disciples, which you are tonight. You, he said, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Or re-seasoned is what he's talking about. It is neither good for nothing but to be thrown down and trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Usefulness. In, uh, influence, effect, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What an amazing statement. Jesus is saying, listen, stand and shine the light of my truth. Be bold about it and let the world see it. And oh, by the way, the world, and by, by the way, I think it's clear that he's intending, the, the world is not going to come up and say, it is so neat of you to shine your light like that. We just love that. We just glorify God. I think Jesus is referring to, in the, on the day of judgment, their attacks against you for standing for what's right is going to give God glory. It's going to be seen on the day of judgment. I don't expect the world to pat us on the back. But on the day of judgment, listen... We've, this church is involved in a lot of cultural battles. We've made a lot of news from coast to coast. And people, Christians, constantly remind me, everything you guys fought for, you lost. Not, not really. We won everything that we fought for. We had, we've had some rogue judge every time overthrow what we won. Let's remember that. And everything we stood for was biblical truth. Absolutely. And so here's, here's the thing. So yeah, but you keep losing. I would rather lose a thousand battles here and now and stand before God and win that day. Amen. When Jesus says, what, are you, what, did you, what did you say, Jack, about the unborn? Did you do anything to save the unborn? Yes, sir. 
And if we take, a, if we take it to the government to fight for the defense of the unborn child, well, that's politics, man. You call it whatever you want. Suck your thumb in the corner, go curl up in the fetal position, and hide out. But you know what? As for us in this house, we're going to serve the Lord. Here's the deal. you got to call out evil. As pastors and Christians, we are commanded to be watchmen on the wall. We are to shout about evil coming. And you leave the defense of your position to God. The results surely are left to him as it is. Thirdly, he called America to go and tell the world. There was a time in the United States of America where the United States sent out more missionaries around the world than any other nation in history. That's no longer the case, by the way. I believe it's uh, VOM, Voices of the Martyrs, I think it was. I'm not sure if it was them or Open Doors. But that United States has been surpassed now by the exporting of missionaries. In fact, the last thing I saw, South Korea sends out more missionaries to the world than the United States. I, I thank God South Korea now has actually targeted the United States, sending missionaries here to America. Did you know that? Go look it up. Thank God. South Korea, if you're listening, send more of your missionaries here, please. And send them to Southern California. On October 11th, 1798, John Adams said, we have no government armed, listen to this, with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion, avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry, would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Do you hear that? The war with Great Britain cut off the supply of Bibles to the United States with the result that on September 11th, 1777, 1777, Congress instructed, this is the matter of National Archives, by the way, its Committee of Commerce to import 20,000 Bibles from Scotland, Holland, or elsewhere to meet the spiritual needs of the, United, of the 13 colonies. How cool is that? On January 21st, 1781, Philadelphia printer Robert Atkin petitioned Congress to officially sanction a publication of the Old and New Testament, which he was preparing at his own expense. Congress, quote, highly approved the pious and laudable undertaking of Mr. Atkin as a uh, subservient to the interest of religion in this country and recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. That was a declaration of Congress in the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in Orange County, someone who attends this church brought me their kids' homework from San Juan Capistrano School District. And it was the learning the alphabet of Arabic and verses from the Quran in their public school system, and when challenged, the school district said they're learning cultural diversity. Islam has infiltrated your kids' schools under the ruse of cultural diversity. And Christians just say, wow. We roll over, we leave the field. The Bible was once produced by our nation's leaders no more. The America of today is openly hostile. You heard that today to the gospel, to the Bible, to the Jew, to the Christian. Smelling blood in the water. Due to the silence of the church, Islam has filled the void and is prostituting our blood-bought liberties. And little do people know or care that according to the Muslim Brotherhood Charter is the implementation of Islamic Sharia in the United States. It's their goal. Alexa de Tocqueville, the French statesman, historian and philosopher in 1830 wrote, quote, upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed there, the more I perceived the great political consequences resulting from this new state of things. In France, 
I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. Religion in America must be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of that country. <laughs> for if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of it. Indeed, it is in this same point of view that the inhabitants of the United States themselves look upon religious beliefs. Christianity, therefore, reigns without Christianity reigns, therefore, without obstacle, by universal consent. I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields, in her boundless forest, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school systems, in her institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic congress, and in her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Alexei de Tocqueville said in 1830. What a statement. Number four, we're almost done. America has been called by God to be a shelter for his people. It's interesting. I mean exactly what that sounds like. The United States, I don't have time to develop this part of it. It's a wonderful pursuit, though, if you'd care to do it. Find out, find out how God, in the establishment of the United States, what role did the establishment of the United States play in the future, what would be the future birth of the nation of Israel? It is remarkable. God established this place as a protected haven for many Jews. For his people, the Jewish people? Absolutely. But what about for us as believers? God called America to be a shelter for us as believers. Remember the words of the founding fathers. Remember Winthrop. Remember Bradford. Remember why they came. Chance, luck, happenstance, or God? The founding documents of this nation and our liberties and freedoms and our laws all include God. Every one of them. From the Mayflower Compact, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Which, by the way, Osama bin Laden had written to his disciples of 9-11 that due to those Christian documents, America was worthy of their attack. Our public school system does not view those documents as Christians. I find it interesting that Osama bin Laden viewed them as Christian documents. By the way, when we talk about this nation and our freedoms, and this nation being a shelter for his people, and again, someone stole my thunder today. I was thinking I was going to be the only one to say this. But can you, uh, can you show me, can you tell me where the separation of church and state appears? We were in Washington, D.C. with our youth group. It was awesome, taking them on a tour of the monuments, showing them God and American heritage. And uh, our, our youth group here, you don't want to tangle with them. They know what they believe. Amen. And so they were there, and they started a little mini-riot there uh, at the Library of Congress. Uh, displayed our, our, founding, our nation's founding documents and nuclear, nuclear storage. It's pretty impressive. And they let so many people up at a time. I'm going to guess somewhere like 30 to 40 people at a, up at a time. And there was a, 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 a class from somewhere in America and their kids were looking and our kids got up there and they're all, I, we had told them, uh, go up there and see, make your way to the First Amendment. And we look at it really close and then we want to hear about it. Well, we, we had an agenda. We were teaching them something. So our high school pastor went over to what was obviously this leader of this high school group, and he, he said, hey, could you, uh, could you point out to me the, where it says separation of church and state? Because that's really important. I really care about that. The guy goes, yeah, right over here. Walks over to the Constitution and st goes over to the First Amendment, and he says, uh, 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 what is, uh, 
Well, you know what? Look, there's a lot of documents here. It's got to be here somewhere. <laughs> Try that on your friends at home. Ask them, hey, where's the separation of church and state? You're never going to find it. The Bible says, First Amendment, con Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. You want to know why they said that? They tell you in their writings why they said that. They said, we didn't want a Church of England here. We don't want a state church. Number two, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Hey, we want people to worship God if they want to worship God. That's their business. You want to be an atheist? You be an atheist. You, you want to worship? We'll worship. Or abridging the freedom of speech. Or of the press. Or the right of the people to peacefully assemble. I wonder how long that's going to last with churches. And, the, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. I thank, I thank God that our founding fathers couldn't find the separation of church and state as we know it today, as our kids are taught in their day. Number five, and we'll end with this. I believe God called America to cry out for repentance. It was said so excellent, so well by Dr. Reagan. So many of our founding fathers and presidents called for national, listen, they called for what we say today, National Day of Prayer. I want you to know that is a relatively new term. Our founders, all the way up until I believe I lost the date somewhere, but I believe it was 1960s. 62 or 63, it was always called something different. Our founders, starting with George Washington, called it the day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Now we have national days of prayer. I've been to the national day, of the presidential national day of prayer. I've been there to joke. It's an absolute offense to God. Even our national day of prayer in America today is not exactly what our founders had envisioned when they called for times of prayer. Humiliation. You know what humiliation is? We humble ourselves. Look into the face of God and see what ills our, nations have, our nation has committed. We repent of those things. We fast and we seek God. The Patriot Pastors, I love these guys. I have several books of these amazing men of God. The Patriot Pastors of the 1740s to 1770s Men of God that thundered from the pulpits. Guys like Jonathan Edwards, Cotton Mather, Jonathan Mayhew, Charles Chauncey, Jonas Clark. Um, the man considered to be the greatest orator in the history of America, Samuel Davies. Samuel Davies, by the way, had a, had a little young man that he was teaching him how to speak publicly. The guy that he taught how to speak publicly was known as the greatest political orator in the history of America. Patrick Henry. They ignited their countrymen with sermons about being dependent upon God. I find it extremely alarming, people, that Hillary Clinton, even again tonight on the way home to get my shoes, <laughs> exchanged my flip-flops for these things. Hillary Clinton today was busted again. On a, on a, 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 she got caught saying something today where the FBI director had to say, she misquote me, it's, that's not true, and it's all on CNN, Fox, and all this stuff. And listen, it, the reporter said, she's been caught in a lie. And I, I, I painfully laughed, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You want to know why? America lies. We get leaders just exactly as we choose. And we have a tendency to choose leaders that condone what we're doing, or they do the same thing we do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we have a guy that's running for president that, in my opinion, is, is like a Goliath to a David. Here's the, here's the true commentary in the United States right now. These are the leaders that have made it to the point and to the valley of decision. One of them will be president of the United States. I loved, if you missed today, Pastor Andy Wood's message, you got to get it. You got to go through that, and I so appreciate that, because we do a very similar thing here at this church, church with every election season. 
I've kind of reduced it down to, and you guys have heard it before, it comes down real simple. All the beautiful things you pointed out today, you vote, you vote for somebody who's in, who's in favor of God's definition of marriage, and from that point, you can see how they vote in other areas. Then you move on over, you, you vote for a candidate that is pro-Israel, and from there, I'll show you exactly how they're going to def, uh, vote on defense bills and other things. And then you, thirdly, the trinity of truth, you go on over and you see how do, how do they vote on the unborn child. And from those three trinity of, of, of truths, you can determine. And you look at these two candidates, and I don't know, quite know what to, what to do, what to tell you. But one has always been a liar, and you know exactly how she's going to go. The other one lies and then changes his mind and flips back this way. And so some people say, well, there's hope for that one. Maybe. The tragedy is, it ain't good. But it doesn't have to be that way for the church. If God's people, if God's pastors are not going to wake up, then may God's sheep go and bite the pastor on the bum and wake him up. But something's got to happen. If our nation's not going to be rescued, then may the church be revived. May the church be revived anyway. The church is to be righteous. Ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we are to be righteous. And we're to act righteously. There's no other way to redefine that. We are to be known by our acts of righteousness. This is not some sort of legalism I'm speaking. That's ridiculous. We are to be a changed people. The world is looking for a change. They don't realize it yet. They're blind. They don't know that. They're lost. They don't even have a clue. We're supposed to help them see that they're blind. We're supposed to help them. We're supposed to show them that they're lost. They don't know that. Well, I wish somebody would do something. God is saying, you do it. That Jerry Brown, I know. But you know what? You have more power than Jerry Brown does. You're a Christian. He's got, he's got the state legislature in his pocket. You've got God in heaven listening. We need to pray. We need to seek God. And we need to stand. I believe the greatest scourge of this nation, there's so many, but I believe the greatest scourge of this nation, God will not, he is not letting this abortion issue pass. We have killed and done the exact opposite of what God had said. God said, defend those who cannot defend themselves. And many Christians have stepped down, stepped back from the fight because people, the culture's been taught to rise up and say things like this. Don't you believe in a woman's right to govern her own body? Of course I do. Don't you believe a woman has, a control, has control over her own body? Yeah, absolutely. What does that have to do with anything? Well, then you, you can't talk to a woman about abortion. She has control of her own body. I, I can't, I've never understood that. Are you kidding me? That logic must come from hell. Think about it. A woman has 100% control over her own body. Of course she does. But what does that have to do with abortion? Because the body that's inside of her is not her body. There's somebody else inside of her. You have 100% lady, you have a have, girl, you have 100% control over your body. Amen. Uh, the interesting thing about pregnancy is that ain't you in there. It's somebody else. It's called life. It's the way it works. You guys, I've got to close with time. I, we have to end on this. I, 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 for those of you who don't know, pray for us. We, um, we are in a lot of trouble in this state for a lot of things. Uh, we've got three different lawsuits with the state of California right now. Um, one of them is we sued the governor. And I don't know, do, do you attend a church somewhere? Do you go to, anybody in here go, go to a church? Ten of you. Uh, go, please do me a favor. Go home and ask your pastor what they're doing about this. On January 1st of this year, Jerry Brown issued a decree that violated, by the way, federal law. It's the only state in the union that's doing this. Jerry Brown has required that churches fund abortions. It's never happened before in the history of America. Hobby Lobby won the case in the Supreme Court. 
that that would not be the case. Jerry Brown said, we are not going to listen to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we filed a lawsuit against the governor. It's in court right now. And we had, I think, I forget what insurance company it was, Blue Cross, contacted them. Yeah, yeah, you guys have to pay now. We were mandated by the state of California. Blue Cross has to pay. And you're a church, you have to pay us. So we're not going to pay you. But if you don't pay us, you're not going to have insurance. We're not going to have insurance yet. Think about this for a minute. Where do you draw the line on this? Are you not a worshiper of God? Did not God instruct you to tithe to him, to give to him? So you're worshiping the Lord, right? On Sunday morning, you put a, you put a nickel in the bag as it goes by? That's a nickel you gave to God in worship. That's a spiritual event. The state of California wants to take half your nickel and fund abortions for it in your act of worship. What do you think about that? What does your pastor think about that? I don't know what your pastor thinks about that, but I know this. I cannot do that. So we wound up giving over, quitting insurance for staff for for this church. And uh, now we've just agreed to pay each other's medical bills with a group across the U.S., a Christian group. A gentleman, by the way, that started it, Dr. Paul from England, loves the Lord, medical doctor. But we have to take a stand. You see, well, what if you lose? You can't lose if you're standing for what God has said to stand for. I want to show you a clip for this reason. If you've seen it, fine. If, if you haven't, remember when you see this or think about it to pray for us because um, Glenn Beck asked, how far are you willing to go on this? So I've got to ask you something. How, 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 con- how convinced are you of God's word in your life? At what point will you give it up? I believe it was Dr. Reagan today or someone said that the church has reached the place where it's going to be persecuted now. I believe that we are in the age right now of what this term I've invented, white, we're in white collar persecution. We're not bleeding yet. They're getting us like, like this. Go ahead and, and roll that video and then we'll end. And uh, California now forcing churches to foot the bill for elective abortions after state officials deem them a, quote, basic health service. But isn't that violating federal law? Remember the Supreme Court's Hobby Lobby ruling that argued that religious employers are exempt from paying for things like this. Here to weigh in is the senior pastor of Cavalry, Chino Hills, Jack Hibbs, and the senior counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, Casey Maddox. Good morning to you both. Thank you. Casey, let me start with you. Explain what's going on in California and how you're fighting back about what appears to be illegal and unconstitutional act by the state of California. That's right. This is basically a bureaucratic sneak attack on religious liberty from California. What happened is that uh, the ACLU was uh, urging uh, the California Insurance Department to declare that abortion is a basic health service, and they agreed. And so what they did was to force every health care plan in the state to immediately begin providing elective abortion. And we have, uh, have been pushing back uh, by encouraging churches. We filed a complaint uh, with, uh, for churches and for other individuals. Uh, alleging that this violates the federal Weldon Amendment, so federal law, uh, the Weldon Amendment, that specifically prohibits California from discriminating against health plans because they exclude abortion, and that's exactly what California is doing. And, and Pastor, tell us how you got involved with this. What <laughs> happened to you, and what effect it has on you, and what you're going to be doing? Well, it's amazing because we received a letter from our health care provider stating that this would be the case in California and that our insurance premiums would have to be forced to uh, fund and pay for these elective abortions. And as a pastor, you know, Jesus said, I've come to give you life, not take it away. And, and our conviction, our religious persuasion, here we are trying to obey the Bible and love life and, and speak on life. And now we've got the government of California coming in and saying, listen, we're going to trump your beliefs. We're going to go beyond your beliefs. And we're going to impose this upon your convictions and upon your biblical worldview. And it's, it's honestly unacceptable. In terms of the legal view, let's talk about the, the law in the state of California and what the Department of Managed Health said about the Knox 
Keen Act, and Casey will tell us what that means. The Knox Keen Act requires the provision of basic health care services, and the California Constitution prohibits health plans from discriminating against women who choose to terminate a pregnancy. Thus, all health plans must treat maternity services and legal abortion neutrally. What does that mean? Is that a neutral statement, or is that a, an unconstitutional statement? It, well, it's clearly illegal, and, and frankly, it's nonsense. The idea that the California Constitution uh, is now forcing churches to provide elective abortion coverage, California didn't interpret uh, this law this way. This Knox Keene Act isn't new. It's 40 years old. For 40 years, California did not interpret it this way, and it just suddenly, uh, all of a sudden, decided it was going to, uh, to interpret this 40-year-old law to mean that churches are forced uh, to provide elective abortion coverage. It's complete nonsense. As, as a final question, uh, Pastor, how far are you going to take this and how far are the other churches who have been affected by this and other religious organizations affected by this in the state of California? Right. We must stand against this because what we're talking about is something that trumps, in our opinion as Christians, as pastors, something that is above even the law or the land, or as this case, which is not the law of the land, and that is our obedience to the Bible. Again, God is for life, Jesus is for life, and we're going to stand against this. We cannot comply. We're being asked to violate our religious convictions. This is preeminent. This is our freedom that is under attack by a government, frankly, that is not upholding uh, the law of the United States, and we're gonna, we believe we have the law on our side, and certainly God on our side. Well, well, thank you both, and uh, please let us know what happens going forward. Okay. We so, appreciate you being here, and we'd love to know what people at home think. What do you think about this? California out of control? Okay, so that's happening now. That's already, that's already going on. Your, your churches are doing that. Churches are paying unless they unless they refuse to pay like we've refused to pay. You can stand. We'll stand in closing. Listen, you can stand. You've been sitting a long time. You guys, here, here's what's going on. Notice what's happening. No longer don't let anyone tell you as a Christian, I don't get involved in politics. Because politics gets involved in you. And now because we've been silent for so long, the politicians, they don't expect to fight from you. And so what they do is they come on in and they're staking now their their flag in your very Bible. And that cannot stand. The hour is upon us now to stand for righteousness. That's going to result in you getting engaged in the culture. Father, we beg of you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, send revival to the house of God in America. Awaken us, your pastors, Awaken, Lord, your flock across this land. We pray, Lord, that as we heard this day, and as we've been comforted by the fact that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. That you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we thank you, Father, for that great stability that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, rose again for our sins, for our justification, and that by faith in him alone, there's the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Thank you, Father. We ask you to bless the remainder of this conference tomorrow. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.